So I'm in your hands. You You're tell me what hands. the agenda is here. Priti, why don't you introduce the group? Hi, this is the Mount Madonna School of Values and World Thought class. Um, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. We've prepared a few questions for you, but first, would you like to share some opening statements? Sure. Um, I was delighted to be asked um, to have a conversation with you. I have to admit that when I travel around the country and talk to our members, I don't often get to talk to people in your age group about the future and about the world. So I just consider it an incredible opportunity and privilege to learn sort of how you see things, what questions you're wondering about. Because um, I feel like what I will do is carry this conversation with me as I leave tonight to go to Chicago and then to LA and then up to San Francisco and back to DC this week. So I appreciate the opportunity. What are some of the biggest misconceptions about the work of the union that you encounter and would like to see changed? Fabulous question. We think that there has been a 40-year attack on unions that has been systematically um, drilled uh, since the Ronald Reagan took on the air traffic and controllers. And so we think one of the biggest misconceptions is that unions only care about the people we represent and that all we think about is how to improve the lives of the 16 million Americans that currently have collective bargaining. And uh, what we are trying uh, to do uh, as SEIU together in partnership with other unions is uh, help make the case that what we want to do with the 2.1 million members of SEIU is use the power that we have together as an organization to speak on behalf of the 100 million Americans who are working full time but can't get ahead. And so I would argue that um, our purpose, which is to improve the lives of everybody in our nation and make sure that there's a future uh, for the next generation uh, is constantly attacked as only caring about how much money we make and how to expand our dues units. Mm -hmm. And so I would say the central problem of American labor right now is that we have not consistently made a case that we want um, to raise the wages and create good jobs for everybody in this country. Sure. Oh, hi, I'm Lena. You once said, all workers have value and every worker deserves respect. How do we as a culture begin to become more aware of the dignity of all labor and give it its due respect? And what do you think prevents us from doing that? Mm, I wish I could ask you all that question. <laughs> um, let me, that first phrase, um, all work has value, every human being deserves respect, is not what I said. It is a reflection of 4,000 conversations that our union had with the best member leaders all across the country when we were retooling the vision statement for the union. And so it's our vision for a just society, which is that all work should have value and that every human being deserves respect. That's the first line. And I, the second part of the question was, um, how, do we, how do we make that happen? How do we restore dignity at work? I think the first thing we've been trying to do is shine a light on the problem by talking about fast food workers who are earning $7.25 an hour or $8.65, depending on where they live, working 40 hours a week and not being able to provide basic necessities, food, shelter, housing. Um, and then the second thing is to show that adjunct faculty who are part-time professors in higher ed are earning about the same amount annually as fast food workers earn. So if somebody who has a master's degree and a doctorate has pursued education, still can't work and make ends meet, the economic system in our country is broken. And so beyond service work being valued, we need to value the dignity of everybody's labor. And so we have to shine a light on the problem first. And then the second thing I think we have to do is show that other parts of the world have solved this problem. 
So in Sweden, in, Denmark, in Australia, and Brazil, service work is about $20 an hour, fast food, child care, home care. And so that country's made a decision that all work should have some a value where people can work full time and expect to get ahead. And that basic promise has been broken in our nation. And so we think we have to restore it by shining a light, showing that other countries in the world have solved the problem, and then organizing our political work and the uh, organizing work we do with non-union workers together to create a solution. So we think a great solution is what Seattle just did. I don't know if you heard about it, but the people of Seattle made a decision to use the mayoral election to say that all work in the city of Seattle should be no less than $15 an hour. And they, had a, they wanted to raise the minimum wage in Seattle. And I think the Seattle City Council is voting this week so that 100,000 people are gonna have their wages almost double over the course of the next three to five years. And we're, everybody that does work in the city of Seattle is gonna have a minimum of $15 an hour. So that's a way in which we think we have to use the political process to show that work has more value. And then we have to try and negotiate directly with employers. So our fast food workers movement that I'm sure you've read about is another way where we're trying to say to the top three multinationals in the country, McDonald's, uh, Wendy's, and Burger King, that if a million people that make burgers and sell them in this country could go up to $15 an hour, it would affect the wages of four million others that work in fast food. And when you can lift wages across an entire sector, it, everybody's wages go up. So we think we have to have a fight about wages as a way to restore dignity uh, for people's work. Hi, I'm Cassie. Um, given the emphasis on college education in this country, do you find that people who do not have college degrees, despite their intelligence or competence, feel less confident in standing up for changes that need to happen in the system? Not at all. <laughs> that has never been the experience of this union. This union's been born out of people that didn't have college degrees, who knew they deserved better and were willing to fight for it. So our union was born in 1921 in Chicago by immigrant janitors who people ridiculed as nothing more than servants and scoffed at them about trying to form a union and expect better for themselves and their families. And the way that flat janitors were paid in 1920 is they got a free apartment in order to clean the building 24 seven and shovel coal into the furnace for heat in the building, and that was their job. And if they didn't get their jobs done, um, their wives and children helped them without, there was no other additional compensation. So they joined together and said they wanted a union. They fought for 10 years before any union would recognize them, and that's how our union was born. It was born because no other union at the time would accept them. They were immigrants and women and African Americans and a lot of unions didn't look like that at the time. And so I would say it's the fearlessness of people regardless of education that has birthed our union. That happened again in hospitals. It was uh, laundry workers, African-American laundry workers in New York and in uh, San Francisco, Filipinos in Minneapolis uh, who had the courage to say, um, Women were being paid $2 an hour less than the men in the laundry. The women got mad one day when the port truck drivers got their wages increased and they walked off the job and said, you know, we may be fired, but we'll probably find another bad job somewhere else in the city. Um, and then I would say our college educated members have also had similar moments where they just decided enough is enough. And that's what we think is happening all around this country with adjunct faculty. We just had six universities here in DC vote to form a union. Howard, American, uh, Maryland Institute of Art in Baltimore. Uh, we're organizing right now at Georgetown. So that's catching fire where people think, you know, I've worked all this time. I'm in a huge amount of debt having gone through college. Um, and I probably need to join with my other faculty to bargain with the university to lift everybody's wages. And that's what's happening now. So 
There's nothing about the degree of education in our experience that is linked to people's decision to join together with their coworkers and try and improve their lives and the lives of their families and communities, ultimately. Did that answer your question? OK. Hi, thank you. In an article about SEIU, you said, Leadership in this moment of crisis for working people will transform our nation's priorities and get our country back to work in good union jobs that can support our families and nourish the dreams of the next generation. And I'm curious to know what you think characterizes the kind of leadership we will need to do that. Mm. Do you believe that statement that I said? Yes. Oh, good, good. I, as you're reading it back to me, I was thinking, now I wonder how many people listening to me at that moment actually believe that. Mm. Because, you know, our country is divided on this vision, I would say, deeply divided. And it's part of what um, I think is the challenge of the moment. So one part of leadership, I think, is understanding that most people don't agree with that statement. And that my job as a leader is to understand what, what do you disagree with me about and how can I help you understand why I think what I think and see if you're willing to come with me to at least try and create a um, shared understanding of the current moment. And the way we talk about it in our union right now to help people understand what I'm saying is the immigrant rights movement is at a, a, cur a sort of key moment where they've spent the last 15 years having a debate in this country and organizing and taking arrests and marching and fasting and a whole bunch of other kinds of organizing to have a debate about whether this nation is ready to accept that anybody who has come deserves a path to citizen, full citizenship in our economy and democracy. Well, it took 15 years to create the political wind where even now the most conservative members of the House of, in, here in DC and the Senate actually believe that we should create a path to citizenship. Likewise, with the LGBT movement around the question of the freedom to love and marriage equality, when I came out as a lesbian in 1978, 79, most of my uh, friends did not jump for joy on that question. You know, people were being abused and beaten, and there's been a path, right, of people courageously deciding to come out to themselves, their family, that has changed the nation's thinking about no matter who you love, you ought to be able to get married and have the full rights and citizenship. We don't believe in terms of economic justice that we have yet, we are on the beginning of a path where we think we have to shift people's thinking about the value of work and the dignity of all people because we have had we think a corporate and right-wing agenda in this country um, damp down people's expectations of what we deserve um, as a people. And so um, I think leadership in this moment requires both being courageous in, in the individual conversation, but also having a long view mm -hmm. about we're, it's going to take us some time to shift things. So. What I try and do is point out to people that are incredibly discouraged about how hard we're working and yet wages aren't rising. I say, look what Seattle just did. Look what the adjunct faculty, American University adjunct faculty just doubled what they earn. It used to be 1700 for a class in a semester. They're now going to earn 3500 for a class. It's not enough. But it's the, it's the right, we're sort of chipping away at people's understanding about what we deserve. And um, so that's the second thing I would say is taking the long view. And the third thing is um, uh, valuing building relationships is another thing as a leader that's really important that you have to, um, like, SEIU, uh, when I took office, was not well liked by the rest of the labor movement because we didn't build bridges. And we thought we were ahead of the pack and people should follow us. And I had to go and do one-on-ones with every president in the labor movement and say, 
Uh, we all have a lot to learn from each other. Working people are facing the greatest crisis we ever have. What can we do together that will change it? Um, so I think that the, another thing that's really important about leadership in this moment is being willing to build bridges. Um, because no one of us can tackle the enormity of this problem alone. And um, that's really important. And then the other thing I think that I'm learning as president of SEIU is that it's really important for us to lead on all the ways in which we are divided from each other. So it's really important for me to stand against racism. Because racism isn't just an individual behavior. Racism is an economic structure that was set up to keep uh, wages down. And I have to connect the interests of white workers, Latino workers, African American workers, and Asian Pacific Islander workers together. And then the other thing I have to stand against is sexism. Because it's another way in which wages are kept down and we are separated from each other. And um, people assume that I will do that because I'm a woman. But there's a lot of women leaders that don't call out sexism, uh, and I think we need to. Because again, it's not just an individual behavior, it's a structure that was created to uh, keep people separated from each other and to not allow us to create a force for change uh, in this nation. So those are the things I can think of about uh, leadership in this moment. Um, the other thing that I'm learning is SEIU is in a moment where we think we may lose 300,000 of our members from June to January because of a US Supreme Court decision. And so the other thing in this moment is being able to take um, a hit and be able to press forward. And so we call it both and, that we have to lead in this moment both with uh, absorbing attacks but then standing up and pushing back and fighting forward is how we talk about it. You. You're welcome. So um, you mentioned sexism just now. And uh, I read a recent White House report about um, the minimum wage that states that one of the most significant factors in the gender pay gap is the overrepresentation of women in low wage jobs. Correct. Um, what path do you think we need to follow in order to ensure greater gender equality in all levels of the wage scale? Wow! <laughs> it's so great that you're asking this question. Well, we think what we have to do is uh, reinvent the ability for working people to join together and bargain collectively. And I don't mean revive the labor movement or revive unions, because I think what I'm talking about is something that has not yet existed in the US economic system. And we have to create ways for minimum wage workers to join together and uh, lift wages again. And so one example of it for us is what we just did in Seattle. Because women and men, we, we call minimum wage the great equalizer. Women and men are both screwed in my mind. I hope you don't mind me using that language. <laughs> if they're paid minimum wage with no benefits, no minimum wage right now in the US economy means no benefits and no guaranteed hours. And 80% of people being paid minimum wage are having their wages stolen by their employers. They have to work another hour after they've clocked out or they're going to lose their job or the supervisors rewrite how many hours people actually work that month because they're trying to hit a certain amount of labor costs in order to get a profit. Those are the reasons why wages get stolen. And on average, people have two weeks of wages stolen every year. So, and again, two thirds of those workers are women. That's the other upside down problem uh, here. And so we think people have to come together to bargain wages up. We also think our government needs to take a stronger stand. So. There was just a big debate here in Congress about pay equity, pay fairness. It was voted down, it was voted up in the Senate, it was voted down in the um, House. And the reasons people said they weren't voting for it were outrageous. Um, but, uh, so I think it's gonna require organizing and, and sh again, similar to this other question that was asked, we have to shine a light on the problem and then we have to organize the people that are experiencing the problem to put pressure on government and employers to do better. 
Did that answer? Yeah. You can ask, do you want to ask a follow-up question? You, um, you look a little skeptical. Well, um, I suppose that what you're saying is kind of that um, it's not limited to women and that in order to, uh, to do that, that it needs to be a collective thing from everybody, women and men. And right. So we collectively bargain for registered nurses. It's 80% women that are registered nurses. Although men are entering because of the military and veterans needing to get employment. And the military is the best trainer of nurses right now. Because we have shut down a lot of nursing schools because of education cuts at the federal and state level. So oddly enough, the US military is training more registered nurses than any other part of the government at this moment, which is another outrage, by the way, because that's like upside down as well. But um, because of union contracts, women are paid the same as men in registered nursing, as an example. Because teachers are unionized, women and men are paid the same. But these female-dominated jobs registered nurses and teachers are not paid as much as engineers, which is male dominated. So there's also a systemic problem about how women and men see choices at every level that we have to correct, which is much more fundamental. I think there is an issue you're raising that because of my union's focus on minimum wage work, uh, we aren't, there is a co sort of comprehensive attack that we need to make about the gender pay gap. But I would argue that because the institutions that fight for that are getting weakened by the right wing, like we lost a million union members just last year. The 30% of the people in this country used to be in unions in the 70s. We now have 11% in the public sector, 6% in the private sector. There's been a sort of crushing of organization, and that organization is the thing that lifts wages and closes the gap. So I think the biggest lever on gender pay is to increase the number of people that have an organized voice in the economy. Hi. My name is Lexi, and this is a bit of a complicated question, so if you need clarification, feel free to <laughs> ask. Um, How funny. I'll try my best. In our Values and World Thought class, we read an interview with Ernesto Cortez in which he discussed how unions serve as a type of mediating institution. We understand the mediating institution to be a site of civic education where people come together to discuss and take action on matters of civic importance. This is an important form of community building. Are there other civic, cultural, and social possibilities that unions can bring into communities in addition to their primary purpose as a mediating institution? Could you tell me what he said again about mediating institution? You know, I've known him for 15 years and I've never heard him describe it this way, so I'm curious. Uh, the mediating institution is a site of civic education where people can come together to discuss and take actions on matters of civic importance. Interesting. And the question you're asking me is, are there ways in which the union has done that or could do it? Or What I'm curious about is if the union serves sort of a bridge between the people and the government and a place where they can kind of come together and collaborate and discuss for what they're driving for. Um, that forms a type of community of people who are looking for a way to better their livelihoods and if there are other ramifications from coming together for that primary purpose outside of just what they want to gain through the union. Got it. So Ernie and I disagree on uh, the definition of the union as a mediating institution. So let me take, explain my disagreement and then answer the question. I actually think what we are is an economic um, uh, lever in how uh, workers are able to level the playing field between themselves and their employers on what work is worth. So when a meat packer has the ability to bargain directly with the owner of the meat packing, it, he's able to think about his safety, the conditions at work, 
um, how that meat packing plant operates in Iowa. And so while it is a mediating institution in terms of civic engagement with our government, our central role um, used to be improving the economic well-being of the people and the whole community. Because when meat packers got more money in their pockets, they went and spent it in the grocery stores and in the community. And it, it was a way in which um, the economic well-being of the community improved for everybody. Does that make any sense? So what he's speaking about is now that we've lost our economic ability, to drive wages up for an, uh, a whole community, we have become more of a civic force because those meat packers in Iowa represent probably 15% of the community and their union makes sure that every election people get educated on the issues, they learn what the how to register voters, they um, help get out the vote, so that we become, we help drive the civic life. And I would argue that that's the most important role we're playing right now, as we try and rebuild the ability of workers being able to come together and, and raise wages again for everybody. Unless, that's what we think is really important to deal with the grossest economic inequality of our time. Unions have to return to being an economic force in addition to a mediating, an ability to gather people together. Does that make any sense, what I just said? And so for us, I just saw our Executive Vice President Valerie Long uh, joined us. She's leading a group of leaders in our union where we're organizing 50,000 security officers. So when 1,700 security officers in Newark, New Jersey form a union, their minimum wage job becomes an $11 or $12 an hour job with health care and the beginning of pensions and stability in the workforce and ability to get um, education and training on the job. And so their kind of precarious life of living paycheck to paycheck becomes a life where they can think, gee, you know, maybe I need to... Uh, do something different for my niece who's trying to go to college, or maybe I'm going to spend my extra money on my own education and training because I want to learn to do green clean. You know, there's lots of choices become different. And then that security officer can think about how to engage in community activity or political activity after the economic stability occurs is kind of our experience. So it's again that we're both a mediating influence, but what we, we are trying to do is, is become an economic force for change. So this gender gap issue and minimum wage issue can be addressed uh, as well. <clears throat> did, did that answer it? Yeah. Okay. In your speech at the 2012 SEIU convention, you said... Holy moly. <laughs> you guys have done your research. <laughs> okay. You said, each of us brings our respective strengths from our identities, from our customs and cultures into this incredibly proud and strong National Leadership Committee. It appears that you are describing an aspect of a pluralistic community. Can you explain how the process of pluralism works to produce a better society? Wow. Okay, well, I'm... I don't know if I know the exact definition of pluralism. Oh, I have a definition. Oh, okay, good. Oh. <laughs> I want to, I, uh, I kind of, I have, I have a notion of that, but yeah. dang. Uh, pluralism can be defined as the collaboration and dialogue amongst a, diver, a diverse group of people to establish a common good. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, I absolutely, I actually believe that our union is an incredible gift because unlike churches, which are pretty segregated, synagogues, uh, all different kinds of religion tend to be more segregated in terms of who comes in the door or how they're organized. Um, where we live be, is pretty segregated in a lot of communities in this country. Um, and our union is a place that you described, which is, um, you know, we are 50% people of color. Uh, we are two-thirds almost women. Uh, we uh, do all kinds of work. 
And um, what I love about our union is it's a chance for me to meet people that I wouldn't meet anywhere else in my life. Um, and I do think it's why we feel called in this moment to build a sense of unity across in terms of this vision of what we have a right to expect as individuals and within our families and communities and what we owe the next generation, um, that we can forge it inside this union and together with other unions and then our social and economic justice partners to forge the common good in, in our definition of the common good as opposed to the common good definition that is being thrust on us by an agenda that's pretty controlled by the very wealthy in this country and by multinational corporations. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Zoe. Um, I read a quote from you in Business Week magazine that read, um, our local unions and divisions should drive our national priorities, not the other way around. Could you talk more about this? Um, I think that was right as I was elected president in 2010, yeah. One of the issues inside of our union when I was elected president was um, how do we set our national agenda? And I was responding to a question saying that I really wanted, because I had worked inside of our healthcare division and had spent a lot of time with our local leaders, um, listening to people about the priorities that we needed to establish as an institution. And so I wanted to um, strengthen the ability of our members and local leaders to set the national priorities um, at, at that time in 2010. And so I was speaking about sort of economics, healthcare. Our public division was really concerned about retirement at the time. And they wanted to see that in our national agenda. Our members were incredibly concerned about education, you know, access to good quality public education in their communities and have their children have the ability to get higher education, whether it's community college or four-year college. And so um, that's what I was uh, speaking to, was that deep uh, yearning that our members had to see their hopes and dreams kind of reflected in what the union was working on nationally. Hi. You once said, my faith taught me we are call all called to think about the common good. How do you think growing up in a religious household has shaped your career? Um, it's funny, I called my mother uh, last night and she's not a Facebooker, an emailer, or a texter. So you have to communicate with her the old fashioned way, which was by telephone or, um, and I said to her, I want you to know how much I appreciate um, the three things that I believe you taught me, which I have to tell you, it was a combination of growing up in a family of 10 and my religion, but I, it's funny, I wouldn't, my mother is religious, but I wouldn't call our family a religious household per se. Um, but I know that her belief uh, was communicated through how she taught us. And I went to Catholic school. I attended Catholic mass regularly. Um, but I would say that it was uh, my religious upbringing was um, more plural, pluralistic in the sense that um, I grew up at a time when the Catholic church was making a shift from thinking we were the biggest, baddest religion in the country, which I remember hearing as a four and five year old that we were better than everybody else. And my church went through a shift that said, you know, we are part of a larger faith community that includes people of all religions and faiths. And um, we need to embrace that um, we're no better than anybody else, but that we are all people of faith. And my mom taught me that. And um, I would say that the biggest thing her faith taught me is that things that seem impossible can be made possible if you get a group do, to do it. Mm -hmm. And I had that lived experience as a uh, third oldest in a family of 10. Uh, 
and it could be just simple things like getting three grocery carts to the checkout line because she had to go run and bit, get my uh, younger brother at school. And I'd be like freaked out thinking, how am I gonna get these? And then I just got my little brothers and sisters to help me and the cashier taught me how to write the checkout. Thank God it was the right amount, you know. <laughs> and so things that seemed impossible to me became possible. Um, because she had faith I could do it, and because I had faith that we could work together to get it done. Which, frankly, for me, was not so much about growing up Catholic as it was about uh, the basic goodness of all people and having that reinforced over and over again. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Martin. As the co-founder of SEIU's Lavender Caucus, which works to improve rights for the LGBTQ community in the workplace, what would you say is the main challenge facing this group? And what needs to be understood when confronting these issues? So do you want to know the main challenge now or when it was founded? I think now is more interesting okay. as it's relevant. It's very different today than it was when we uh, created it. Um, I would say today that um, the LGBTQ members in our union are really concerned with how we get the LGBT community that's working on marriage equality and non-discrimination in employment to think about how to work with us on a sort of basic economic uh, justice agenda. And so our members are deeply concerned about forging an alliance that gets the LGBT community to think about the 60% of the LGBT community that's living in poverty. And we've just done an analysis with um, LGBT partners here at the national level where we looked at economic data, and LGBT families are more likely to have uh, precarious work, you know, uh, than a lot of other families because of fear of discrimination in the workplace. You know, 27 states doesn't protect uh, LGBT workers from being fired for simply being LGBT. So um, it's the biggest challenge, I would say, is how do we forge an alliance on both the uh, equality and economic justice issues together? Thank you. You're welcome. When asked by the Daily Beast if it is reasonable to expect to know the sexual orientation of someone serving in public office, you said, I think we should allow people to individually decide that question and not speculate and call them out. What do you think we as a society can do to transcend the preoccupation with this topic and begin to recognize people based primarily on competence and character? Um, I don't know if people are, no. The person I think of when I, uh, it's a kind of a simple, answer in my mind is come out. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest way to transcend it is to make it um, less of a guessing game. And my experience in my own life is that uh, the sea change has occurred in the hearts and minds of this country is because sons and daughters, nieces, nephews, aunts, grandmothers, mothers have all made a decision to come out. And it I, I had my own experience of this in our union where I had worked with these women who do home care in LA for like five years and then I stood up at our convention and came out with my partner and spoke to uh, Equal Rights for All, I think was the name of our resolution. And these women came up to me crying, saying, you know, we used to hate you. We, we hate you as a people. Is how she, she was speaking to me in Spanish. And, she said something about, you know, I've been taught to hate you, but I love you, so I have to reconsider what I think. And I think it's sort of the individual transformation that occurs when people are willing to say who they are that, that is going to free us of the preoccupation. Hi, my name is Tobin. Yeah. What are some of the accomplishments of which you are most proud of in your work with SEIU? And what are some of the biggest challenges you have faced in your job? Hmm. I would say that um, my proudest accomplishment is um, uh, assisting people in realizing their own leadership 
And that's happened in a million different ways, which is uh, when a non-union worker decides that they're going to talk to their coworkers about forming a union, that's an incredible act of courage. And I've seen people become personally transformed, whether they won their union or not. And um, I would say that that's my deepest source of pride, is that sense of inspiration I have about people being willing to stick their necks out um, and try and improve things for themselves, but also act in a belief about the common good, essentially. Um, and the way that was expressed for me directly was in a series of campaigns that our union ran on uniting hospital workers in California. And over the course of 10 years, we were able to organize 60,000 hospital workers in California, and we raised wages 18%. People got fully provided family health care for the first time in their lives and started a pension. And it created a sea change, even with the non-union hospital uh, employers who raised wages 6%, provided employee healthcare coverage for the first time because the, the non-union employers were like, whoa, we better like change things for people or everybody's gonna go to work at the union hospitals, which is exactly the dynamic you wanna create when people join together. Um, so that's a huge um, source of pride. I would say another source of pride is being in a union that made the decision our members made on this vision for a just society, that our union wasn't gonna be about our members, but about the whole and uh, fight for the respect of every human being and get work to be valued again is a huge source of pride from our 2012 convention. And that we said that economic inequality was the number one problem we were gonna tackle in this country because I think that's a source of a lot of other problems. So our convention agenda is a source of personal pride um, for me. And then what was the second part? Pride and uh, challenges. Um, you've asked a lot about them, a lot of the challenges, I would say. I'd say um, we are up against some of the best financed, well-funded opposition in my entire generation as a leader and an organizer. And I'm deeply concerned about our ability to stay focused because I have a deep belief that when people come together, there's no force too great that we can't overcome. And um, I would say a challenge is in the darkest of times, holding out that light or hope that people can see so they will stay um, organizing, um, educating, uh, leading in a way that uh, faces that opposition head on. I'd say the, the other challenge we face is for the first time in SEIU's 90-year history, under the leadership of its first woman, we are gonna lose members. So the objective reality of this organization is, hmm, that girl takes over and things go to shit. <laughs> so there could be a, um, if, if I wasn't leading in a way that people believed in, there could be a internal critique that the objective measurement is that the union is not doing as well because we're losing members. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I would say a challenge is helping people understand the forces that are creating that loss in our members and then convincing, including people in creating a plan which we call the path to power and helping people believe that that path is going to lead us not just to replacing those members but creating the next form of collective bargaining and organization that lifts people out of poverty again and so uh, i would say that's a big challenge holding people's sense of hope and optimism that we can create something new as things get objectively worse do you see, it? like that is a very, uh, like I've been called crazy, like just let me give you a couple of examples of when I project that, the head of another union said to me, you know, I thought you were crazy a year ago. I thought you should 
take some aspirin and lie down and take a nap because you're way too excited about how bad things are and what we need to do differently. And then I kind of watched you, and I think you might be onto something. <laughs> so I think part of the challenge is being we willing to say the unimaginable and hold on to, because two years ago people said $15 an hour, are you kidding? These people just flip burgers. They aren't worth $15 an hour. People said that to us. And people said that about immigrant janitors when our union was born 90 years ago, but they prevailed and we believe fast food workers will prevail and janitor, you know. So I would say that another challenge is being bold and confident in the face of unrelenting attack on work and working people and galvanizing people's hope to believe that we can chart a new path together. You're welcome. So, Mary Kay, I want to take a, a brief moment here because we've reached the end of our first part of the time with you. Okay. I want to, uh, if you guys, to, to feed back a little bit what you heard that struck you oh, so far. That'd be great. Okay. So, um, let's just see who's, who's got something to say. Okay. Um, I really liked what you said um, that things that seem impossible become possible when you get a group together. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was very relevant. Like, as a group, we're able to come and see you and like talk to all these amazing people. And I would have never gotten this chance mm -hmm. if I was just trying to do this alone. On your own, yeah. So, I just so you have that as a lived experience. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I was really struck by what you said about uh, how you weren't so much uh, inspired and influenced by being a Catholic, though that was a very important thing, as you were just by the goodness of people and the common goal. And I think that's, because I, I feel that organized beliefs of any kind can distract people from themselves and what they personally can do to make the world a better place. And I think you put it so well. And I thought that was, <clears throat> that was very cool. We should send the tape to my mom and see what she thinks. <laughs> um, I like what you actually said just now. Um, when people come together, there is no force too great that we cannot overcome. I think it's really important to remember that and as we grow increasingly isolated in our society with technology and everything, that really the greatest power in this world is just human connection. And it's a good reminder. So thank you. Who's next? Sorry. Uh, it's sort of like um, what Lena and Lexi said. I really liked your story about when you came out and the women coming up to you and um, you know saying that 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 about how you were able to sort of shift their viewpoint just through connecting with them. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, they knew somebody. Yeah, I think they that, knew that somebody. that's something that can really you know we can use that in sort of all aspects of life about how. You know, no issue really is too big if you just sort of start at the bottom and work your way up and just doing the little things. I just thought it was, it was really relevant just to, you know, take a step and with, and by taking a step outside of maybe your com comfort zone and maybe <clears throat> you can produce something great and really change, change the world. I'm always interested to hear what people have to say about what makes a good leader. Um, I think that what you were saying about leadership, uh, you know, the ability to work with people that you disagree with and the ability to have a long view, um, I think that that is very true and I think that's hard to, hard to really do, but I think that, I, I, yeah, I always think it's interesting to hear what people have to say about that. Yeah, I was also struck by what you said about being a leader and how, like, you have to take hits but still have, like, the drive to push forward and not let that affect you and just keep a strong face and keep going. Again, you were talking about leadership <laughs> and how it was not about just taking power and saying this is what we're going to do and I don't care what anyone else thinks, it's about... That would be so much fun yeah. some days, <laughs> I have to tell I'm you. Sure. <laughs> um, but it's, you said it was about communication and being able to ask what people disagree with you about and like getting them to understand why you think that and understanding why they disagree with you. Mm -hmm. And it's all about communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, from my perspective, um, 
this is an education. This is education yeah. where we understand something that is really in the heart and soul of our yeah. national community that in many ways to the privileged is invisible because the megaphones are, are in other people's hands in right. general. Right. And uh, th so we have some systemic issues that need to be addressed and they need to be addressed in a sense by this group yep. and their peers, the yep. larger peer group, because that's in the ladder of things. We, ha we hope, I hope, they will have access, but they will bring with them a sense of understanding yeah. that will uh, drive different choices uh, when it comes to governance at yep. all levels. And yep. so I, I just thank you for providing this education for us. This has really been wonderful. You can thank our um, 2.1 million members that make it possible. You know, it's the nursing home workers that are changing bedpans on the midnight shift, the janitors that are taking two buses to get to work for six hours and cleaning the equivalent of 60 homes a night on the square footage that they um, do. It's these adjunct faculty that are stringing together four jobs at four different universities in order to make ends meet. There's like the countless acts of incredible courage and the fearless pursuit of the American dream that make us possible to provide this education. So thank you on their behalf.